This is Harsh Rules. I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection. Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection was released in 2016 by GMT Games and designed by Harold Buchanan. This game supports up to four players and takes from three to six hours to play. This is the second episode in the series covering this game, so if you missed the first episode, you definitely want to go back and check that out before proceeding on with this episode. In the first episode of this tutorial series, we covered off on a high-level overview of the coin series and this game in particular. In this second episode, we will learn more about the game as we set up a scenario for play. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Now let's set up Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection. Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection comes with two booklets. The first booklet is the Rules of Play, and the second booklet is the Playbook. The Playbook we will cover off in a future tutorial, but for now let's focus on the Rules of Play. Pages 37 through 39 of the Rules of Play booklet contain the board setup requirements for each scenario. In this tutorial, we will set up the medium length scenario, the British Return to New York, which is detailed on page 38. These scenario pages are organized as follows. First is the card setup information for creating the game deck. Next is the position for all the markers on the numbered track that runs along the edge of the board. Following this is a listing of the game pieces that are available to play and game pieces that are unavailable or require specific actions to bring them into the game. Beneath this and wrapping around to the other side of the page is the setup information for each space on the board. First is the setup for city spaces then reserve spaces, next colony spaces, and finally the single island space, the West Indies. Now we're going to learn about how to play the game as we set up for each section on this page. First, let's set up the game deck. In each game of Liberty or Death, players work their way through a deck of campaign event cards. These event cards are organized into three time periods. The early years of the Revolutionary War, from 1775 to 1776. The Middle War years, 1777 to 1778. And the Latter War years, 1779 to 1780. Each year of the war will require a shuffled campaign deck. In a similar fashion, Liberty or Death can be played in three game lengths reflecting these portions of the war. The long game, titled A People Numerous and Armed, encompasses the entire war and requires six campaign decks to play. The medium length game, British Return to New York, requires four campaign decks to play. And the short length game, the Southern Campaign requires only two campaign decks to play. Next, we're going to learn how to prepare one of these decks. To create a campaign deck for a year of the war, divide the cards into three time periods as listed in the upper left hand corner of each event card. While you're organizing the cards, you will find some that are white that say winter quarters on them. Place these cards in their own pile. You'll also encounter cards that say Brilliant Stroke on them. Place these cards in their own pile for later. Once you've got all the card types sorted out into their individual piles, then you're going to want to shuffle them. Shuffle each pile into its own deck, except for the Brilliant Stroke cards. Those cards you can distribute to each of the players. The owner of a Brilliant Stroke card is indicated by the flag emblem at the top of the card. Each faction will receive one of these cards except the French player who will receive two. We will cover off on the significance of these cards in the next tutorial. Once you have each of the piles shuffled into its own deck, 
Then we're ready to start building individual decks to represent each year of the war. To create a specific year of the war, select the deck that covers that time period. Draw 10 cards from the top of that deck. Normally you would do this with the cards face down. I'm showing you this inverted view so you can see what happens next. Slide out 4 cards from the bottom of the newly formed deck. Next, draw 1 card from the top of the shuffled Winter Quarters deck. Slide that card randomly into the last 4 cards. Straighten your cards and place them face down on the table. And that's all there is to it. You've just created a campaign deck for one year of the war. You'll need to create two campaign decks for each of the three time periods. When you're finished, stack these decks together with the earliest time periods on top. This is what the decks of the long game looks like. The shorter scenarios start later in the war and have less decks, but are organized in the same fashion. And with that, the campaign deck of event cards is complete and ready for play. Any remaining event cards can be placed back in the game box. You won't need them any longer for the game. Now that we've got our decks set up, let's start setting up the game board, starting with the number track. Now we're going to learn how to set up the board for the medium duration scenario, the British return to New York. If you remember from the first tutorial, two key game metrics are control and influence. Tracking influence is key for accomplishing the primary objective of determining the winner of the American insurrection. So let's start by looking at influence. A quick reminder, influence is the five-point scale that tracks the people's support or opposition to British rule. For influence, players record their progress with two markers placed on the number track that runs up the left side of the board and wraps around the top. For the Patriot and French players, also known collectively as the Rebellion, this is the total opposition marker. At the beginning of this scenario, total opposition for the Rebellion is 5. Therefore, place the total opposition marker on the number 5 on the track. For the British and Indian side, referred to together as the Royalists, this is the total support marker. At the beginning of this scenario, the total support for the Royalists is 3. Therefore, place the total support marker on the number 3 on the track. A good skill to develop in this game is always being able to tie out the current marker number with the activity on the board. So let's do that as we set up the existing influence on the board. First, let's walk through how the Rebellion got 5 influence points in total opposition. On the right side of the screen is a list of the cities and colonies that we need to place markers on for setup. The colored circles on the left of the name represent that space's population, and to the right are the appropriate markers for influence and control. As you can see, the Rebellion currently has passive resistance in Boston. If we review our math, Boston's population is a 1, with a 1 multiplier for passive opposition. This adds 1 to the total opposition score. The Rebellion also has active opposition in Massachusetts. Massachusetts population is 2 times a multiplier of 2 for active opposition, which equals 4. Add 1 and 4 together to get 5, which is the Rebellion's starting total opposition. For the Royalists, total support works in the same way. Quebec City has a population of 1, multiplied by a 1 for passive support. New York City has a population of 2, multiplied by 1 for passive support. Add the 1 and the 2 together to get a 3, which is the total support for the Royalists at the beginning of the game. 
Pretty simple, right? It is just basic math, but once the board gets filled with markers and one side gets close to victory, you might want to true up the numbers to make sure you're accurate, and that's how you do it. Next, let's talk about resources and the game's economy. Resources are essentially the game's currency that players may use to purchase player actions like commands and special activities. First, let's cover off on a key rule. Factions are not permitted to transfer resources to another faction except by command or special activity or an event. Each faction must manage their resources and expenses independently. Each faction begins the game with a set amount of resources. Resources are updated on the same numbered track on the game board. Resources are tracked by these colored wooden cylinders called resource markers. The Patriots begin the game with two resources. The British five resources. The French also begin with five resources and the Indians begin the game with no resources. Unlike influence measures like support and opposition, you can't neatly tie out the resource levels to the controlled spaces on the board. The game economics are much more complex. However, the control of territory spaces is a key driver of resource funding for all players except the Indians. The majority of resource funding occurs during the winter quarters phase. We'll go over the funding mechanisms for each faction in just a moment as we cover the game's economics. Right now, since territory space control is a key resource funding driver, let's also discuss the placement of the control markers to see where each faction stands. At the beginning of this scenario, for city spaces, the Patriots control the following. Philadelphia and Charlestown. The British control Quebec City and New York City. Next for the colony spaces, the Patriots control Massachusetts, North Carolina, and Georgia. The British control New York, Virginia, and South Carolina. Now that we have all the starting control markers on the board, let's take a look at the game's economics to see how this functions. I'm sure you've been wondering, if it costs resources to conduct game actions, how can a faction earn more? So let's pause for a moment and discuss the game's economy. Besides passing during a player's turn and specific event cards that grant resources, which are more of game bonuses than stable funding, there are unique monetary requirements for each faction to increase their resources. During the winter quarters period, there is a resource phase that awards players for specific accomplishments. Let's walk through the common themes of how each faction earns more resources. For each base in play, a faction can earn resources. Base units for the Patriots and the British are forts, and they earn one resource for each in play. For Indians, this is villages. However, the calculation is different. The Indian player takes the total number of villages, divides that in half, and rounds down, and this is the number of resources they earn now the French do not have either of these units. Instead, the French player's funding is divided into two sections. Funding before the Treaty of Alliance is played, in other words, before they enter the war, and after the Treaty of Alliance is played, in other words, after they enter the war. Before the French enter the war, their primary means of funding is the number of naval markers they have in the game. The French player takes their number of naval markers, multiplies that by 2, and that's the number of resources they earn during this phase. The remaining sources of French funding can only occur after they've entered the war. Next, control of the West Indies is a lucrative funding mechanism for the British or French, if the French have entered the war. Whichever of these two factions controls the West Indies, 
earns five resource points. The Patriots and the Indians do not earn anything for their side controlling the West Indies. Moving on to the next category, the Patriots, French, and British earn resources for controlling game spaces. The Patriots can get credit for all game spaces except the West Indies. To earn their resources for this, they take the total number of rebel-controlled spaces and divide that by two, rounding down. This number is the amount of resources they earn during this phase. The British and French players only receive resources for cities under their respective side's control. When the British or French control a city, they earn resource points equal to the population of that space. However, the British player cannot receive credit if that city is currently blockaded. Finally, the French player receives one resource for each level of French naval intervention they have in play. French naval intervention is basically the number of cities the French have blockaded with their navy. The French player receives one resource for each level of French naval intervention. So I'm guessing that now you've noticed the Indian player doesn't have a lot of revenue options. This is true and accurate because this faction lives off the land rather than the civilized world of commerce. When we get to the gameplay tutorial, you will also learn that this faction may conduct several of their actions for free, which balances out their expenses. The next two markers to place on the number track are for the cumulative British casualties and the cumulative Patriot casualties. Remember, these markers are necessary to track the secondary European interests goal in the game. For this medium duration scenario, the war is already in progress. When the scenario begins, the British casualties are 1 and the Rebellion casualties are 3, so place these markers on the numbered track. With those set, let's move on to our last marker to place. Finally, it's time to place the marker for French preparation. As I've alluded to earlier, the French spend a fair portion of this game massing forces in the West Indies in preparation to join the war. The French faction uses the French preparation marker to keep track of this progress. The French are ready to enter the war when they've massed over 15 points in French preparation. French preparation is calculated by taking the total available regulars plus available squadrons plus the total number of British casualties to come up with that number. Once French preparation has exceeded 15, the French player may then play their special brilliant stroke card called the Treaty of Alliance to cancel the current event and enter the war. In this scenario, at the beginning of the game, the current French preparation is 9. That means that the French only need to add 7 more points to be able to enact the Treaty of Alliance and enter the game. So now let's add the French prep marker to the number track. And with that, all our markers are placed and we're ready for the next stage of setup. Now let's talk about units and which spaces on the game board to place them. Remember our cast slide from the first tutorial? Let's look at it again with special attention paid to the counter for each unit. Each faction has a set number of game pieces for each unit type. While this number never changes, these units will cycle through various statuses as players progress through the game. Let's learn about these various statuses and what they mean for gameplay. Game pieces have up to three primary status positions in the game. First, a game piece can be in play. In other words, that game piece is deployed on a territory space on the game board. Second, a game piece can also be classified as available. Game pieces that are available are stored in these respective boxes on the game board. An available status means that that game piece is available to the player and can be deployed with the appropriate action to the game board. Finally, the British and French factions have a third classification. This is known as unavailable. 
This classification represents that a unit may be allocated to the war, but has not yet arrived from Europe. A large part of gameplay for these European factions is to make these units available, especially for the French player. Unavailable units are stored in the inner white section of the box. Each faction's box also includes a reminder of the total number of each unit. This makes it easier to inventory the number of units available, unavailable, and in play. A quick note, game pieces eliminated in combat may be stored in the casualties box before being released back into a faction's total forces during the winter quarters phase. More on that in the next tutorial. Managing base units in the game are handled slightly differently. The available forces box for each faction's bases are located here on the game board. Each faction has their own unique take on bases, whether they're called forts, like the British and Patriots, or villages for the Indians. The French do not have traditional bases, however, they do have naval squadrons, or ships, at their disposal. Once placed in their available forces box, bases are removed and placed on the game board in ascending order. Therefore, the highest visible number indicates the number of bases in play. While we're talking about bases, a quick note. When bases are eliminated, they are placed back in their available forces box and not in the casualty space. Fringe squadrons are an exception to the rule. Remember, I warn you, there would be a lot of exceptions in this game. With the appropriate activity, the French squadron can be flipped over to its blockade side and placed on a targeted city. This also increases the level of French naval intervention. The British can play their own naval pressure activity to reduce the blockades around the cities and force those ships back to the West Indies. In this way, the French player can use their navy to harass the British faction, to cut off their resources and limit their ability to place British troops. Now that we've reviewed the game pieces and their various statuses, let's learn how to set up each faction for our scenario, the British return to New York. First, let's set up the Patriots. In total, the Patriots have 20 Continentals, 15 Militia, 6 Forts, and one, and only one, leader, Washington. In the first column, I've listed which of these units are available. Place this number in the available forces boxes for units and forts. The second column lists which units are currently in play on the game board. The pane on the right side of the screen shows the Patriot units in play and the territory space to place them. I'm not going to animate these units because they're so tiny on the screen and they clutter things up. So pause this video and take a moment to set up your own board at home. I'll just wait patiently here until you're ready. Now let's set up the British faction. The British have 25 regulars, 25 Tories, 6 forts, and 3 leaders. The first leader in play is Howe. Now you'll notice this pane is different than the last one in that it has an unavailable column. The British have six unavailable regulars and six unavailable Tories. Place this number of units in the white section of the available forces box for the British. For the British faction, these unavailable units will become available after the first winter quarter session. The second column lists the units to place in the Available Forces box and the Forts Available box. The third column lists the units currently in play. On the right side of the screen, you'll see the territory spaces to place them. Pause this video and take a moment to set up your own board at home. Next, let's set up the French faction. The French have 15 regulars, 3 squadrons, and 2 leaders. The first leader is Rochambeau. As discussed earlier, a large part of this faction's gameplay is making French units available. Once the French preparation number of 15 is exceeded, the French faction can enact the Treaty of Alliance and enter the war. In this scenario, nine French regulars are in the white unavailable box and must be made available. 
Six of these French regulars have already been made available and count towards French preparation. Rochambeau also waits in the available box until the treaty is played. On the right side of the screen, you'll see that the French also have two squadron markers located in the West Indies. The French player can build up their navy as part of preparation, but cannot conduct blockades until after the treaty is played. If you'd like, pause this video to place those units. Finally, let's set up the Indian faction. On the left hand of the screen, you'll see that they have 15 war parties, 12 villages, and 3 leaders. The first leader in play is Brant. You'll also see here that the Indian faction has available 7 war parties, 10 villages, and 2 more leaders. Place these units in the available forces box for the Indian faction and the villages box. Now on the game board, the Indian faction has 8 war parties and 2 villages in play. The locations to place these units is on the right side of the screen as usual. Go ahead and pause this video if you need to, to place those units. And now that we have the board set up, that concludes this tutorial for Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection. In the next episode, we will learn about each faction's unique game actions such as commands and special activities, and how to use them in the game. Until then, this has been Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.